Welcome back. Today I'm going to be going through more of the Rite of Spring. Last time I spent about an hour pulling the piece apart and throughout that hour we got through about a minute and 30 seconds of music. So being optimistic there, this is probably going to be somewhere around a 17 part series in order to get through the entire piece. It's a lot of work to go through a piece of this size. Uh, and especially breaking it down in the details that I want. Very, I want a lot of specifics so that I can apply them then to my own work. I'm also, as a sort of pet project on the side while I'm doing this, I'm composing small little musical examples that are similar and use similar techniques that Stravinsky uses in this piece. So again, I talked last time very briefly about how to learn things really well. And I think that one of the big tenets of learning is doing it yourself. Uh, number one, do the analysis yourself if you have the time. So you can watch mine, then you can go through and dig through it yourself. Uh, then in number two is apply the principles that you learn. If Stravinsky is using, for instance, a lot of parallel fourths, then I want to go in and try and use parallel fourths in a small example by myself. So I can kind of figure out what the intricacies are of using parallel fourths as a coupling instead of something like thirds or sixths. Uh, it gets you to think about the material in a different way and you actually uncover little problems that you had never thought of before. So one of the main things I was trying to do in the example that I composed, which I'll probably show at some point, maybe it'll be over here right now, I'll just show a like, brief section of it. One thing that I was trying to do was create the idea of sort of like polychordalism or polytonality where maybe the bassoons would be playing and they'd be in parallel fourths while someone else was doing like melodic material that was based on an octatonic collection something like that so it's trying to apply that and i got those ideas from the analysis that we did last time anyways let's get right into it because i hopefully don't want to make this be a 17 hour project analyzing this one score so let's see if i can get through it a little bit faster than that so last time we stopped off here with the end of this sort of first section. feels like the music comes to a resting point. It's kind of nice that we stopped there. And then this flute motive is the thing that really injects energy back into the texture and connects us to the next idea. So we can see that here. This flute idea is like a little connecting piece of material. I'm not really sure what color to give it. I'm going to give it red right now just because it seems like principal material since nothing else is happening at this moment. It seems like the most important little connecting gesture. You can see here, um, again, I've been talking a lot about counterpoint, how these lines sort of, uh, they're, they're like in a dialogue. It's, it's never that like they're trying, they're not crowding space. He's not putting a bunch of different lines on top of each other. So in this case, the English horn finishes and right as the English horn is finishing, then the flute picks up and takes off. They're, they are dove, dovetailed there by one eighth note, which is going to create a connected sound so that even in performance, if there's a little bit of inaccuracies, the instruments will still probably be on that pitch together by the time that, or on, uh, they're on, actually on different pitches in this case. The English horn is on uh, F sharp and the flute is on A, starting on A. But you'll hear that connection, that moment of connection. Now we go off into this section, it's sort of like this whole first movement feels like it's in two sections, two parts. It has the first part, which is what we did an analysis of, which feels like a lot of solos and lines that are interacting with each other. And then the second part really feels like everything comes together in a big tutti and, and it has a ton of musical energy. Like this section is wild. I remember the first time I looked at this score when I was a kid and I was just bewildered by like, how could Stravinsky put something like this together? It's so dense, there's so much going on. So let's go through and see exactly how much there actually is going on. So we come to these textures. I'm going to do a quick overview. So this is a like a textbook reading strategy, which is like just go th flip through the chapter and see what there is ahead of you. So I'd like to get through this section from rehearsal seven, hopefully to the end of the movement today, but we'll see. So there's this section and then the texture kind of thins out here at nine. Then at 10, looks like it's gonna start thickening again. Thickening a lot more. And then these giant page, this giant page on page 11 and page 12 is even more dense. The giant climax of this section. And then a brief reprise here at 12 with the initial bassoon melody 
and then we're moving on. And you see here that I did some analysis of this already. I did this before I started this series. So I started analyzing this just on my own, then thought, hey, why don't I just like do this and let people follow along, follow along with what I'm thinking. Okay, now let's break this section down in, in more depth. So composers typically put in rehearsal marks because that's a definitive musical section has started. There's something that has changed that allows our ear to catch that as a distinct unit. So here we can see this is a lot of wind stuff. There's a celli pizzicato solo. That's very interesting that that's in there. Cool. Uh, and then the texture dramatically changes. So it thins out and then it comes back in all full at eight. And then at nine, again, it thins. So it's a thickening and thinning of texture. At 10, it thickens. A lot, actually, at 10. Oh, oops. And then at 11, it thickens again to its maximally thick texture. This is when the most is going on. He seems to thicken it and then gives two bars to actually progressively thicken that texture, but it's a progressive thickening. Whereas at the beginning of each section, the texture just expands. So we hear a distinct f sectional, it's like, okay, there is something new happening. And then a massive thinning at 12 to allow this little connective material between the first idea, the first movement, and then the second movement or the second piece. Don't really know, it's all kind of one piece, but it flows through different sections. They have different titles. Okay, so that's so it's actually quite sectional. So we'll take apart each sec each section at a time. Let's go back to number seven. So the flute gesture uh, concludes right here with this F. And now, what is the most important material? Again, look for things that the composer has written in that signals that it's important material. Louder, dynamic than everything else, or solo indication, or something that's clearly melodic material. So it's obvious here that the piccolo clarinet is playing the mel melodic material. So it's indeed it's playing this material here. And then Stravinsky sort of discontinues the texture for a moment. And there's actually a uh, little like kind of duet material between the English horn and the bassoon. That's neat. So I'm not sure which one of those is most important. I'm, I actually have the music today. And so I'll play a piece of it and then we'll, or I'll decide uh, which, which one is more important. If you think differently than I do, put it in the comments below and let me know that I got it wrong and that the bassoon is more important than the English horn, something like that. Uh, then it's probably likely that our brain will pick up here again on the clarinet material as the most important. And then again, we have bassoon and English horn. So there's this kind of dialogue between the piccolo clarinet or the E flat clarinet and the bassoon and English horn. Very interesting. So again, he's using these uh, strange winds. He's, he's not just giving a flute solo. He gives a small piece of connective material to the flute, but no main lines. I think here that the horn line is gonna be secondary because the horn is playing faster moving moving material. Throughout this section, the oboe material, the, how we've actually heard before, so this repeated note and then the, the trill. I think a big thing that is being introduced here are these triplet figures with all of these grace notes. I think that that's probably gonna be the accompanimental figure if I had to decide, but Maybe not, maybe that, I, I think it's I think it's accompanimental. So I would say accompaniment is probably gonna be all of this stuff. And he's trying to create a texture with it. It's like that. Got accompanimental stuff. And I think that the stuff in the winds is flourishes up on top. So it kind of fits into the texture but you're gonna notice that those the piccolo, especially up at the top playing very quick notes, that jumps out every once in a while and it's like a sparkle. So maybe it's not supposed to be a part of the texture. Just gonna quickly look. Yeah, it looks like the oboe and the clarinet are doing very similar things. And the bass clarinets are also doing similar things. Like this is a ridiculous orchestra, two bass clarinets 
Oh. Then this material is going to continue like that with this material underneath. Okay. I'm going to put this as primary material. I'm not sure which one's going to come through more. I think, so let's, let's take, this is a good uh, ear training thing, is to make a bet about what you think is going to be more prominent. The bassoon is not really thin there, but it's not super strong there either. I think that that's the same for the English horn. I think they're actually going to be quite well balanced. I think that's why Stravinsky has put them both in these ranges. So let's take a listen and, and see if I was uh, right or wrong. Okay, here comes the flute idea. Okay, uh, I discovered something interesting here actually, just because of how prominent the horn is, the bassoon actually gets kind of put into the background there. So that's something I didn't really account for when I was looking at this originally, but the horn, the register that the horn is in is just above where the bassoon is. So it's bassoon on the bottom and then horn in the middle and then English horn on the top. And I actually, I actually hear them that way. I, I hear the bassoon the least, the horn second, and then the English horn the most. Um, funny enough, the horn actually kind of grabs your attention more than everything else, just because it's doing more active material. Uh, I really noticed the horn a lot there, but I think that Stravinsky really wants the the um, English horn and bassoon material to come through because the bassoon was a principal instrument in the first section and the English horn uh, is marked forte and solo and it has uh, material that was originally used as primary material. This or yeah, that's very, very, very prominent in the opening section. All right, let's continue into section eight now. I think here, it, it, initially it looks like the flute has the line, but I don't think that, maybe that's the case. I don't think so. No, I think the clarinet, it goes back to the clarinet, the high clarinet, piccolo clarinet. It's got this line here. And it continues onto the next page. This is something that's really key with a lot of sections of music, is that once the composer introduces what the principal instrument is, that tends to be the principal instrument for that entire phrase. It doesn't really change a lot. This phrase above, he discontinues the material and then has someone else say something and then goes back to the clarinet. Whereas he doesn't really like the clarinet do one thing and then someone else does something else and then someone else does something else and the line is kind of all being broken up. The clarinet is just playing one continuous line and then he interrupts it if he wants to with someone else playing something different, uh, not the clarinet's material. I'm just going to quickly look at, so it's nice to break down some pitch stuff. So the clarinet here is doing something that feels very chromatic. Uh, it's a D, so it goes E, D sharp, and then E, D sharp, D, C, D, so it's kind of chromatic, but not really. At the end, it becomes, it loosens, starts chromatic, then loosens up at the end into seconds and thirds. Something that's very genius here is that in the initial melody, there was a lot of triplet motion with grace notes, which is something that you can see here in this accompaniment texture. And Stravinsky is really making good use of that now as just background material. I think what we're gonna hear in this section is bassoons as background texture, making this kind of blur with this triplet idea. So it's now not principal motivic material. Well, it still is in the, in the uh, clarinet, but it's also underneath supporting everything as accompaniment. 
I think that all of that is gonna feel like background texture, everything on the bottom of the page, essentially. So all of this, I think, is gonna be background. And I think that what's gonna actually come through as a secondary voice is this flute, these flutes. Not the, the alto flute. I think the alto flute is gonna be kind of hard to hear, or maybe the alto flute is in, um, is in counterpoint with the clarinet. I need to listen to it to tell. Because the alto flute is kind of becoming more and more and more active throughout this section, and it's obviously going to be more principal material in the next section, or seems like more principal material. I actually think that this all continues as secondary material. Funny enough, when I was setting up the audio for this video, I listened to this section, and I'm, I'm really convinced that the alto flute is secondary material, and the oboe is the solo there, as Stravinsky has indicated in the next section. Again, go with the composer's indications. Dense music like this, it's really good to write in solo like Stravinsky has here so that you know that, that so when that person is playing, if you've never played in orchestra, it's the psychology. So that they know, oh, that's supposed to come through even though there's a bunch of stuff going on around me. In this case, there's this huge chaotic texture right before the oboe comes in. He might think, oh, I'm just going to be part of that texture and then miss his solo, um, miss like projecting it like a solo. So, oh, I did a different color there. Blasphemy, can't do that. Okay, I think that this, this is how this section fits together. Flutes are playing uh, sort of counterpoint material that's also motivically interesting and is gonna become more prominent. Uh, piccolo clarinet is on top of everyone. It's gonna be the most prominent material. And then underneath is bassoons creating this sort of like weird wind accompaniment. Again, Stravinsky is being very diligent in avoiding most of the strings. Here we have a uh, contrabass just sneaking in, but only one of them. So it doesn't have that big string European chorus effect yet. He's really avoiding that. Uh, it's something that actually a composer like Debussy also avoids, but he avoids the strings in a different way. He allows them to play, but they play purely background material and then he allows the winds to come forward. I'm thinking like La Mer or uh, Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn. Prelude to the, uh, the Prelude is, uh, there's, the strings don't, don't get a primary moment where it's there delivering the melodic material until like several minutes into the piece. Very atypical for music of that time. Okay, let's listen to this section. Rewind just slightly. Okay. Here we go. Okay, here's eight. Okay, I heard that exactly how I noted it in the score. So the flutes, they kind of pop out when they, when they go above the staff, uh, like it, at this moment here, when the flute is popping up above the staff, you can kind of start to hear it, but honestly, I can hardly hear the alto flute. Like it's just in the background and I just don't even know that it's there. Now, we could argue about this and say, maybe Stravinsky shouldn't have written all those notes for the alto flute because the poor guy's got to go like, he's like, ah, I got to do all of this. That's a lot of stuff for him to play if he's not going to be heard. But at the same time, someone listening might actually notice it, that the alto flute is going crazy and they're like, oh, cool. And then they'll hear a little bit of it. And then when the transition happens at nine, that material is recontextualized. You're gonna hear it now because it's just two players. It's the oboe, the first oboe and the alto flute player. So that's kind of a nice, yeah. I also don't really notice that there's double bass. Like he, he sneaks it in in a way. That, that doesn't become obtrusive to the texture. So now it's quite clear that what we're doing here is some kind of orchestral crescendo. We start with two players, and then it looks like on the next uh, system, he starts adding in more players. So it creates this sense of orchestral crescendo. If you want the orchestra to get louder, the best way to do it is to just add more people in. That's really the best way. More people playing, the louder, the fuller the sound will be. You want it to sound more fragile, take people out or divide people like divide the strings, that's what I mean. So here, actually, this is what I wanted to note about the alto flute part, is these trills. The trills that are appearing here in the alto flute part are, they make this like 
ornate gesture that looks very soloistic and uh, motivic, they actually, that's just really, it feels almost like a trill. It's like the trill is happening and then it goes for a moment and then comes back to the trill and then and then back to the trill. So it doesn't really feel uh, like primary material. It honestly, it's starting to feel like a complemental material here. So the oboe is playing probably what we would consider the primary material here because it starts as the primary instrument. But I think you can make a case for the fact that the E flat clarinet, when it starts playing, is the primary material. Da, 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 da. That gesture really sticks in your mind. It jumps out like crazy. I think it's because of the dynamic that it's written at and also the fact that it's up extremely high. In this case, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark the clarinet part as primary material. I'm gonna do something here, which I don't, it, it's, it's contextual. So this is secondary material here, clearly. And then I think that the alto flute becomes background material and that the oboe becomes secondary material. Now, obviously at nine, we're not gonna hear it that way. I think we're gonna hear the oboe as primary material and the alto flute as secondary material. But then that gets recontextualized on this page because the oboe is playing what I think is secondary material and the E flat clarinet is playing the primary material. And maybe this is just the prominence of that in the texture, but like it really jumps out. So when I play it, just see if you like, you're gonna notice the E flat clarinet, I guarantee you. Then we have this little flute gesture uh, uh, with a clarinet gesture. I'm gonna just break this down quickly and just look at the notes. The flute starts in a very unideal register and then goes up and then comes back down. So it's gonna feel like it just pops out of the texture for a moment and then returns back into the texture. The clarinet also does the same thing. And it concludes, I, where is it? Oh, it concludes right at the next bar. So it's it's shorter. The clarinet and the flute, they kind of work together. The clarinet goes first and then the flute goes next. So they, they kind of uh, mirror each other. It's also key, the positioning of those comes immediately after the, the piccolo clarinet, the E flat clarinet plays its gesture. E flat clarinet completes its gesture here and then that flute material takes off. So maybe it's a kind of like a gestural background, something like that. I think I'll go with that. I think I'll retain alto flute as background material. Because really, if we look at it now, you can tell that it isn't really doing anything super interesting. It's playing C. I'm going to be uh, an octave too high. It's just doing like C stuff. Up and down, all over C. Not super interesting. Whereas what the oboe is doing is a little bit more interesting. And it's it's interesting to think of the... the, the uh, Alto flute is playing all of this material and it looks very much like the oboe is in a different key. So it's got E flats. What does it have on the previous page? E flats and B flats. So it's kind of like a two flat, two flat diatonic collection. And then the alto flute looks to be very much in C. Again, it transposes down a fifth. So it looks like here it's written in G, but it's playing C. So all natural pitch collection. So again, here it's, he's maintaining this idea that each instrument is playing in its own key. They're all kind of off doing their own thing by themselves, which is not this European idea of tonality where everyone is coming together and making chords that make sense vertically together. What he's doing here is he's trying to linearize, every, linearize everything. Everything is horizontal. Everything is doing it, operating within its sort of own world with its own rules. Alto flute is trills and these gestures. Oboe has this more angular line with alternations. And then the E flat clarinet has this very angular gesture up and then this kind of like jagged figure coming back down. I think that the flutes here are embellishment material that's just basically Flute and clarinet. I think it's it's really just filling in for um, for the winds. He actually, uh, sorry, filling in between when the clarinet has played and then whatever's gonna come next. 
uh, the clarinet is going to play something else again. So the clarinet sustains over, and as it's sustaining, then it plays this. I missed that, actually. I thought that it discontinued, but it, it keeps going. It sustains. So clarinet sustains while it's on a long tone. Flutes embellished to fill the space a little bit, and then concludes here. Again, we, I think we can see now that it's really not about the oboe. And that's also true here if we look at the previous section, because the previous section was very much dominated by the E flat clarinet. So really the oboe is only refreshing our palate for two bars before the E flat clarinet comes in again. Okay, we made it to 10. Let's listen to nine. I'll rewind again a little bit and then we'll listen to it. All right, here we go. E flat clarinet. Okay. I heard that as I I heard that as I analyzed it. So it feels like oboe comes in, it's very prominent, and then it's like it switches roles. So maybe the correct analysis here is actually to label it like this. Oboe is primary material right here, obviously, because that's how it sounds. This flute is still secondary material. And then down here, the oboe plays primary material. And then the primary material becomes secondary as a new, more important gesture is introduced. So it's this idea of establishing something and then layering. Once you play something several times, we're going to see that this in the next movement of the Stravinsky. When you play something and you repeat it and it becomes established in the listener's ear, then you can just move it into like a mid-ground or background texture and put something else on top of it which you want them to then pay attention to. It's a great strategy for creating a complex texture where everything sounds like it should be there because you've like, you played it, we, we got to hear it and understand it and then repeating it, it just falls into the background of the texture. I wanna note here with the oboe, the oboe is playing stuff that's very uh, quartal. That's got a lot of fourths in it. And then it does it, it does it again, but it's a little bit different. Rhythmically it's shifted. Yeah, and then it becomes almost an accompanimental figure over here at the end. So again, Stravinsky is not directly repeating things, but he's taking the same idea and then sort of unraveling it in a slightly different way so that it becomes accompanimental. Great, and then the flutes are a really connecting material. Takes some interest away from the clarinet while it's sustaining, and then uh, also leads into rehearsal 10. Okay. I got to note something right now, which is wild that Stravinsky is doing. He's got his bases divided by six. I do not recommend that anyone writes this. Basically, if you do this, it's going to be like one guy playing everything. And maybe that actually might be what he wants. He might want one person on every line. Another reason he might want two people on every line if he knew that he had 12 bases to give this like wonky out of tune sort of uh, like pagan effect that he's trying to go for with this piece, right? He's trying to not sound like a European orchestra and trying to sound like something that's more exotic. That was like very popular at this time um, with Debussy and other composers doing it in a different way. So I, I think that that might be why. He also is singling out a cello as a solo. And I think that that's likely to create a similar effect. He's trying to create that effect of like, these are all strings by one and it's gonna sound really brittle and fragile in, from a tone perspective. It doesn't have that chorus effect. So here, analyzing the material, it's really clear what is the most important material. Most important material is very clearly the E flat clarinet. Bum, bum, ba -da. Da -da 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 -da. Let's just quickly look at that. Uh, it's in D. It's in D, so it's going to sound up a major second. So, yeah. So, uh, so it's all fourths. 
portal stuff, not using thirds. Very interesting. Then I think he really wants this English horn to be secondary material because he's marked it solo. And he's also marked the first clarinet part as uh, tres en dehors, which I think means bring it out. So that that's probably also some kind of secondary material. I think that everyone else is accompaniment. In this case, we have two types of accompaniment contributing to this texture. So we have the bassoons, which are doing the triplet and grace note figure. Uh, the grace notes are all offset so that it doesn't sound like it's, uh, you can't really like feel the beat. And then the basses are creating this spooky effect with all these harmonics. Uh, I think he's writing the harmonics as they sound, not as they are played. And interestingly enough, the bass and the celli, the only two that are not playing harmonics, are in a fourth. I bet if we look at all of them, they'll all be in fourths. B, and then E. Is that a B sharp? No, 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 that's a G sharp. All right, it's not all in fourths. And then D. B, B, E, G sharp, D. Okay, it's almost fourths. <laughs> it's like he missed the A and just turned it into a G sharp. The bassoons underneath are playing this wacky stuff. <laughs> one has a G sharp, one has a G natural. So again, this idea that like everyone is kind of off in their own world, even when we're putting these textures together. And they're not like, he's not writing a C major chord or something like that. Very interesting. And then it starts to get wild. Now, I think that this is where my analysis is going to really slow down. I'm halfway through my time. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I have time to dig into all of this. So, something that always comes through in my mind is that this, this bottom bass that's pitzing, for whatever reason, it really starts to sound like a pulse. And I think that that is in account with, or the thing to account for here is the figurations. These line up at the same time that this lines up. So the low notes in the bassoon and the low note that's pitched in the bass all lines up. And we get this kind of feeling that there's this pulsation behind everything. Now, that's really awful because it's pulsing on weird beats of triplets. So it's like a giant polyrhythm is taking place. Everyone comes in and then there's this pulse just underneath everything at very strange times. Uh, you can actually see here that Stravinsky has written the bassoons in a way that they're grouped in fours. So four triplet eighth notes, the beginning of each of which has the grace note accent on it. And then they're offset. So you can see here that they're interlocking like that. So the top two are here and then the bottom one, or the bottom, the top, the bottom, top one is here and the bottom one is here. They're offset. And then the bass is pulsing with the bottom note of each one of those. Everyone else is basically aligned to what the actual pulse should be, what the conductor is pulsing. So winds are following the conductor in some loose way. They're pretty much aligned. Uh, the Clarinet in A, number one, is sort of not aligned because he's coming in on off beats every time. Like each, each of his uh, melodic phrases comes in on an off beat, but everyone else is aligned. The clarinet is aligned and the English horn are aligned. So those are the guys there. They, they have the pulse essentially. Everyone else is doing this weird polyrhythmic accompaniment. This weird polyrhythmic accompaniment continues into the next page which really adds a lot of clarity to the analysis here. This is all accompaniment with the same polyrhythmic feel. He just continues this, actually continues all the pitches. There isn't a chord change here in the, in the uh, low basses and the bassoons. They're all just playing the same chord, same pitches this entire time. One of them essentially being like a it's like almost like E major with an with a G flat in it with some fourth action with a D. Now, 
We can actually see how this chord is derived if we look at the next section. So that's looking a little bit ahead. In the next section, Stravinsky uses the chord of E major with a E flat seven on top of it. So he uses this chord and he's talked about, uh, I read a quote somewhere that he said that that chord really is like the derivation of the entire work. So I can see it here where it's kind of, we have a split chord tone in this case. We think it's like kind of some kind of E7 chord, but then we also have the G natural, that G natural coming from the E flat seven. So you can see how the, he would like, how you would get, arrive at that as a composer. You go, okay, I have this chord. It's a E major chord with a E flat seven on top of it, E flat seven over E. And then in that case, uh, then you spill it out some other way. You go, okay, I'm going to take the seventh chord and I'm going to just split one of the chord tones in the same way that that other pairing splits the chord tone, splits the third. You have both a major and a minor third. That's what I mean by a split chord tone. Okay. I looked through this before because I'm fascinated by this passage. This passage is really cool. Now, very clearly the primary melodic material here is the E flat clarinet. It is so capable of being very loud. <laughs> Wow. Uh, I think the flutes are playing like not what I would call secondary material, but embellishment material. They're really adding this like vibrancy behind everything, but it's not super important. So this flute goes up and then it is dovetailed onto the piccolo and then the piccolo comes down and it is again dovetailed onto the flute, which then falls. So that little gesture connects together. Um, and becomes this sort of gestural thing in the background. Then we get a similar gestural thing here with flute, oboe, and clarinet. I'm pretty sure that the top flute has an F, the oboes, yeah. So this is a seventh chord sliding down chromatically in the background there. Cool, it's in third inversion because the bottom clarinet is in B flat. So this first note is E flat, and then it's like an F minor chord on top of that. So you have uh, a minor minor seventh chord that's sliding down. And then that, when that immediately discontinues, it picks up again in the flutes. Oops, almost missed that guy. Gotta get everyone flutes here, taking that gesture again. Again, it looks like there's a lot going on, but I bet this was all obviously composed to the piano because Stravinsky played piano. And so it's probably just one big flourish gesture on the piano. And then he broke it apart into individual sections and then dovetailed them all so that the winds would actually have an easier time playing it. So let's look at it. It's actually all G sharps and D sharps. It's just a giant open fifth. that's just like whew, flying around in the upper register. So open fifths, the first one, open fifths, then chromatic descent, on a minor minor seventh chord. Then huge open fifths flourish again, adding sparkle, not adding a lot of complexity to anything. Then we have to ask what's going on in the English horn and the, uh, I guess the A clarinet. <sighs> and then later on the, uh, the piccolo trumpet, this guy has like every possible instrument in this score. I actually put together the ensemble that he has in a Dorico file the other day, and I can't believe the amount of instruments that there are in this piece. It's like winds by five, eight horns, four trumpets and piccolo trumpet. What? Three trombones, two bass trombones, two tubas. So, wild, four, five timpani, two players. Anyways. No one's ever going to write for this orchestra again. <laughs> the budgets will not allow it. Um, I think actually what happens here is that the motivic material then goes to oboe and trumpet. Now, one of my instructors once described this to me as a super trumpet. So doubling the oboe with the trumpet, because the oboe has a very nasal tone, and the trumpet also has that kind of like more biting brass sound in the top. It's an open brass sound like the horn. Uh, when you double the oboe and the trumpet together, it kind of magnifies the trumpet's volume. So maybe that's what uh, Stravinsky is doing here. And you can see with this analysis of the E flat clarinet playing first with that oh, that fourth gesture, uh, and then these people picking up, the, the, they also have sort of a fourth 
material. It's very much the same material. Again, either jumping up through fourths and then having a little flourish through fourths. In this case, the opposite, stepping down a fourth, then a fifth, then up through fourths, doing a kind of turning gesture. The clarinet and the, the English horn, just because I put them before as secondary material, I think that it also stands to analysis on this page that they are also, again, secondary material. So they're kind of creating this sense of chaos. I missed one of the notes. Uh, I got it now. <laughs> so uh, clarinet and English horn are creating the secondary material that's in the background, making the texture feel very complex. They're also like, the English horn is not in a great register for it, and the clarinet is also not in a great register. So just by the orchestration there, those instruments are not standing out. The E-flat clarinet, on the other hand, is going to be standing out like crazy, as well as the trumpet when it comes in on the high A-flat. It's going to stand out. It's in D, so I guess high B-flat in this case sounding. But that high A-flat written is going to really, really, really sound out, sound. Uh, we're going to hear that like crazy. Again, the flutes are always starting in these unideal registers and then kind of moving into the ideal register and then going out. That's why it's this kind of flourish material that's just sitting behind everything. Okay, we made it to 11. Those five bars took way too long. Let's listen to them. Oh, I went too far back. That's uh, the first iterance of the E flat clarinet on the previous page. So there's the trumpet. It really comes through. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I got distracted by the score. It looked like it was different than mine, but I don't think it is. Anyways, we have now arrived after that trumpet gesture. So you really hear the E-flight clarinet in here, then you hear the trumpet. I actually want to let's do it one more time. I'm not going to look at that score. It's going to mess me up. Okay, this is the first time that gesture happens. Interesting, actually. It's very interesting. I, uh, I hear the clarinet a lot here. And I think that the reason I hear the clarinet a lot here is because it, it feels a little bit more melodic than the, the high clarinet. The high clarinet is also, in this recording, for whatever reason, not going for it <laughs> in this section, which I think is a mistake. Uh, the recordings that I've heard before, uh, I know that this is Leonard Bernstein conducting, so I'm very sorry, Leonard Bernstein but I really like it when the E-flat clarinet just like rips these ideas out. Ba, 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 da, de, da, 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 da. It, it, I think it gives this like really wild quality to this melody. Anyways, in this case, I hear the clarinet very prominently at the beginning of this section, then everything gets very blurry. So from an orchestrational perspective, maybe don't shoot for these two bars as the ideal if you wanna make something that sounds very clear and clean where every idea is coming through. Obviously Stravinsky is not going for that. He's going for something that is very chaotic and wild. Uh, then just put the trumpet in with the mute and it's gonna cut through like crazy. Another thing, the mute creates more of a nasal sound so it makes it uh, more similar to the oboe so that they blend together better. One of my instructors described, Alan Bell, he described muting uh, a brass instrument as like making the sound more similar to the winds, giving it a little bit more distinct sound and a little bit more bite. So that's, it might be an interesting way to think about it if you wanna create a bridge between those two choirs. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now this page is pretty overwhelming. Uh, this is the page when I first looked at it as a kid. I was just like, I could never do something like that. This looks absolutely insane. Let's pull it apart. Now, this is all background material. We've already established that as background material. 
Also, when you listen to it, you can't really hear it. So let's just put that in in the background. That's for sure background material. You can see up here that the flutes are maintaining this same idea of just having fill material that is primarily based on open fifths. It's all based on open fifths in this case. So I'll continue. To, this is just piccolos actually now. He got the flutes right out of there. We have this continued descent of this minor seventh chord right here. It happens here again. So if we were a composer working today, what we would do is we would have just copy and pasted this little idea, this descending thing, and just dumped that in at three different spots. We Beginning of the bar, then we put it in the next beginning of the bar, and then, oh, let's put it on the third beat as well. Uh, or sorry, the yeah, the third beat is, you know, what? This is in three, four. On the and of three in the last bar to just throw things off a little bit. That's what we would have done. Copy, paste, dump it in like that. Then we would have taken one of those little flute gestures, the flourishes where it kind of bounces back and forth, transposed one of them up, put it in the piccolo, and then just like dumped that all over this section on top. Uh, not advocating for this approach. I think in general, the copy and paste, you, it's like you should almost unbind that from your keyboard so that you can't use a key command to do it. So it's really hard to do it. That forces you a little bit more to write every pitch. Uh, music is a little bit more interesting when you're not just copying and pasting things. You run into that sound where it's like all the new Hollywood movie scores where it sounds very copy pasted. A lot of it just like Oh yeah, we like this like da 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 which is also a rhythm that is written specifically in this piece. I think that's probably where it comes from. That sort of a complemental string texture. Um, and then they just like copy and paste it everywhere, make it move through a couple chords. Great, we got some inspirational Avengers music or whatever. Sorry. Anyways, um, in this case, I, I think that also he's introducing this other gesture, which is this large um, sort of arpeggiated arc it's here and here and here and here and here in the strings. These strings are playing harmonics, so they're just light, lightly touching the string and sliding up and down. That's it. He marks them in in a really like complex notation. This notation is pretty much antiquated now. You just show the pitch that it starts at and the pitch that it ends at. Or maybe if it's an artificial harmonic, that it's an artificial harmonic. I think in this case, probably just like gliss sol g, and then write the starting pitch to the ending pitch to the starting pitch again with a gliss mark in between it. So much simpler notation. So I think that trumpet, the piccolo trumpet, just because of the register is going to be the primary material in this section. Like, how are we not going to hear that? If, there is no other brass. So no one is really competing for a lot of acoustic space. This is like his obsession with winds in this opening movement. It's been really unrelenting. Now, it appears that the first clarinet and the English horn and the piccolo clarinet all continue with similar material. So I'm going to mark them all as secondary material in this section. These three guys. Secondary material. I think that the E flat clarinet is going to start sounding like it's in the background just a little bit more because the trumpet has really established itself as a main player. And then it's worth asking the question, there are horns here and they're playing the third, the split tone. <laughs> During this entire thing, look at the horns. Look at them in there. Da -da -da -da. Look at them playing the split tone. Oh, dirty, dirty. So, I think the fact that they're playing that split tone is, is interesting. And the fact that they're pulling out that interesting harmonic element that Stravinsky wants to make you hear. He's like, listen to that. It's not just an E major chord or in second inversion. It's actually this crazy thing, or it's not dominant seventh. It's actually this wild chord. Uh, I think because of that, we can clearly classify these guys as a complement as well. I was wondering what they would be. Now, 
a really interesting thing about this for us composers is the structuring of the flourish texture during all this. Because we basically we basically pulled apart everything. Uh, there's this oboe thing that's happening. Ah, oh, great. There's actually more. I think I'm gonna call it secondary material because it, it very it feels like it's almost echoing the trumpet. So if we go up here, uh, oboe and trumpet come in together, and then the oboe continues at a different speed from the trumpet doing things. There is a flute doing a trill in here. This is like the thing that you add in when you're like. What am I going to do with the second flute? Just, ah, just put him in doing a trill. Like, it'll add some energy. <laughs> uh, is it, it's, yeah, it's the alto flute. Okay, great. So he puts the alto flute in to get some extra energy. We actually have all five flutes. We are missing one oboe. We have all five clarinets. And we have... We are missing one bassoon. We, it is very clear which bassoon we are missing. He labels two, three, and then we have the four and five bassoons, contra bassoons in this case. He left out first bassoon. This is really smart orchestral thinking. He knows in the next section that the bassoon is gonna repri reprise the main idea. The bassoon is gonna play that idea again, and he wants it to be the principal player of the first bassoon. So he's gonna let the guy rest throughout this entire section and prepare for his solo. Then when everyone else stops, first bassoon comes in and delivers the solo. Great, great orchestration. I think that's what's going on here. I know it continues. <laughs> but when it continues, likely what, what will happen is we will have uh, an easier sense of what's actually going on here. So like very clearly all of this is accompaniment, this is accompaniment, and then all of the bassoons and the horns are accompaniment. See, they are unchanged. It looks uh, incredibly dense, like a lot is going on, but all of these parts are pretty much unchanged in function. Now, if you look up at the flutes, it's good to compare this flute gesture to the previous flute gesture. Oh no. Zoom out so that I can actually move the screen. Look at this previous flute gesture. Two piccolos, flutes are occasionally commenting. Now on this page, he wants it to sound more full and more energetic. Everyone is going pretty much all the time. But people are resting. It's like, it's almost like two of the flutes have, or fl I'm considering flutes and piccolos as flutes. So when I say flutes, I mean piccolos as well. The, the flute choir, when Two people are usually moving actively and two people are usually static. And that's like, if you took every single eighth note and looked at it, it's basically that. But they're all doing slightly different things so that it becomes this huge wash of texture rather than just being like the one flute goes and the other one goes because then it's very predictable. In this case, that kind of thing. Look at this, have the interaction between those two piccolo parts and then the flutes underneath, all overlapping. Gives us this great, oh, the alto flute starts to join in with the uh, gestures underneath. Cool. So maybe on the previous page, it's better to label him as a, uh... oh, that's why. The alto flute joins in taking one of the lines because Stravinsky no longer has the full chord now because he dropped one of the flutes, because one of the flutes was previously taking the top material. So here, one of the flutes right here is doing the top material of those descending chromatic uh, kind of washes. And then in this case, alto flute takes it now because we've lost one of the flutes because they needed to be contributing to that big texture above. See, Th these little details are really interesting for me as a composer because it gives me insight into how he was thinking about it. Okay, all right, I got that flute. I can use it this time. Alto flute's not going to be as strong, so I'll use the the like third flute or, or, or fourth flute, whichever one he was using. And then over here, okay, well, let's just get the alto flute in doing that now because we need someone to do it. I don't want to miss a chord tone. And then he gets it in that in that way. I think here... 
so second clarinet has has gone crazy. Uh, he is doing all of this fourth and fifth stuff and just making these big arpeggiations through these quartal chords, quartal and quintal chords. I think a lot of this stuff I'm just going to circle as a giant blue because they're all independent lines. So the, the English horn, the first oboe, yeah, oboe one, English horn, piccolo clarinet, A clarinet, the third or fourth clarinet, and the bass clarinet are now all doing essentially their own lines. On top of all of this, we have the trumpet playing loud material. So I'm going to say trumpet is red, and then we have seven lines other than that, all in here. So this is what creates this huge chaotic effect, is that he's written a bunch of lines all on top of themselves. They're all kind of playing very much in this, ah, interesting. They're all playing a lot of two flats material, which is a very close approximation to that E flat seven chord, which is gonna be on top. And everyone else in the accompaniment is playing the E major sound. So it's almost like the accompaniment harmonically is E major with a split chord tone and then everyone above is all B flat major stuff with quintal and quartal chords. So that looks like harmonically how he's put this together. And then occasionally he has these little flourishes coming down in the oboes and the, and the clarinets that are chromatic descents. And then the sparkling flute material above, uh, in this case, I guess the, uh, the piccolos, that has the, the uh, G sharp and D sharp in it, which aren't really present anywhere else. So up way at the top, we have the G sharp and the D sharp in the piccolos. Then in the like mid range and all the winds, we have this B flat major stuff. And then down underneath in the accompaniment, double basses, bassoons, this kind of thing, we have E. So very interesting approach to mm, polychordalism or bitonality. I don't think this is bitonality. It doesn't feel like that. It feels more like it's, it feels almost like a modal approach. So he's not actually trying to move through a chord. He's just, this is the sonority. And each of the instruments has their own mode. And they have their own way of getting through the mode. So the winds are all using fourths, mostly fourths, uh, to generate the material. The piccolos and flutes are mostly fifths, starting with fifths at least, and then going into fourths. And then the accompaniment material is a lot of thirds and sixths in that E major chord. Quite, quite interesting. I've got a lot of ideas now for what I could do setting this or trying to do my own version of this. Oh my gosh, I only have a minute and a half left. I'm gonna go over with this video. Oops. Uh, also violins here are contributing more to this arpeggiation texture. And then we come back and we have principal material in the bassoon as it was at the beginning of the entire piece. Then we have accompanimental material in clarinet right here, like that. This here is fascinating to me. This all is like, he basically wants to get from this pitch to a low pitch. And so instead of just going to the low pitch and playing the low pitch, he's like, no, we're gonna have this really neat little turn thing that happens throughout the through, through all the clarinets and that will get us to the pitch. So he like rhythmically and melodically and gesturally vitalizes that move from one pitch to the other pitch. Makes it very interesting. Also makes it sound maybe more logical, the arrival there, because we feel like we arrived there through some kind of motion. Granted, the motion is quite chaotic. And then we, he plays this, this chord, this accompanimental chord over everything here. And you'll have to forgive my colors now because my colors are all gonna be off. But this is very much, it's basically an ostinato and it's, it's really important. Probably these guys are primary material. You're gonna hear that, those chords as an important gesture. Maybe you'll hear, I don't know if, you, I don't think you'll hear the chords. I think you'll hear this chord the secondary stuff, 
and probably this as primary, like this. Because dum bum beam bum 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 beam bum. Later, the Avengers, <laughs> or uh, any action movie that has been written in the last like twenty years. Again here, first it's pits again. We still have yet to really hear strings play with a string sound together, and this is the first moment that we hear it. Wow. Uh, this is gonna be like a solid three minutes into this piece. That's 10% of the runtime. Okay, let's listen. Let's see if I was at least half decently correct about how all this chaos at 11 fits together. All right. Okay, this is it. Definitely hearing trumpet as primary. Huge chaos behind that. Okay, definitely primary bassoon. Secondary is gonna be clarinet doing a trill. Important new gesture is introduced. Not complete. Clarinets connect. Strings for the first time. Very spooky. Chord. It's, it's, it feels like a compliment or a secondary gesture, and then ostinato. Now the famous section. So, this next section that happens is the really famous section with all of the off, the rhythmically offset chords in the horns. This is also where we first see this chord, which is an E major chord on the bottom with a E flat seven on top in second inver in first inversion. And this chord he notates as F flat, and I think he just does that because he wants all flats and he doesn't want to mix sharps uh, and flats in this case. This section is really interesting and we're going to dig into it in full next time. Uh, the next time I'll get through more music because I've already done some analysis on this, so it won't be, I won't have to think about anything. I'll just describe some of the stuff and we'll move on. Uh, anyways, I hope this has been really interesting and hope you stick around for more of these videos, which are coming very soon. All right, see you in the next one.